Hi, this is the fellow passenger. Today I have the privilege of talking to a very special guest, Danny Wolfers, perhaps better known as Lego Welt. He's also using a lot of other names when he's making music and his output is incredible. I can't think of many other artists who have been so prolific. Just look at his discography. I'm also very curious to hear about his process because when you get a glimpse into his studio, he has got traditionally very desirable gear right next to equipment that a lot of people just almost consider throwaway. And he seemed to put them on the same pedestal. The other thing that I'm really curious about is the world behind the music. If you look at a lot of the album covers, if you check out the track titles, etc., it feels like there is a story hiding behind there. And we get a little look into that world. And I want to know more about that, among lots of other things in the Lego Welt story. So thank you very much for tuning in. So without further ado, let's go for it. So thank you for agreeing to do this chat today. I have a lot of questions, but I want to dive in straight to the deep end because there is something that is very unusual to me about what you do. There's so many other people that have like, okay, they have the Jupiters, they have the prophets, and you do that too. But you also have a lot of sins that a lot of people never talk about or they never glorify, but you feels like you just put them on the same pedestal. I'm just seeing in view now, you've got what looks like a Prophet 5, and next to that, you've got a Timberwolf. Um, yeah, that, that is right. I, I just got that like a, a, a two weeks ago, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, checking that out. Yeah. I'm very curious, like how how... Can you tell me a bit more about, like, because you got the Yamaha SY35, I think, and, you know, like a lot of unusual synths, like what's the background? What drew you to those sort of things that a lot of people don't seem to talk about that much? Um, yeah, uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, yeah, for, for me, um, synthesizers are like a, yeah, a, a cultural phenomenon basically because um it's it's a bit of a, a, a magical machine and an, an instrument of course to to make sounds and um like a, like a synthesizer can can influence um society in a way i mean a, a mostly a cultural society it can uh, uh, be the start of a completely new music style of course and, and yeah and uh, the people that just uh, make songs on it and stuff like that. Um, uh, so each, for me, each synthesizer um, yeah, it has its uh, word within this, uh, um, yeah, how would you call it, uh, world, world of uh, synthesizers or of uh, earth culture, as you might uh, call it. And um, for me, I really don't see any uh, difference between a, uh, I also have here a, a Casio HT3000, uh, which my wife just got uh, for 70 euros uh, from an advertisement in the, uh, online. And um, yeah, because you can make sounds with that, you cannot make with a Prophet 5. And of course, a Prophet 5 is, is a, a beautiful instrument. Um, in essence, it, it's kind of a boring machine because it's it's really a simple polyphonic two oscillator synth. And you, if you know a bit about synths, then you already know what sounds it can make. I don't think there's many people that will make a completely new sound that hasn't been made with a Prophet 5 because um, in a way it, it is quite limited what it can do but of course uh, what it does it does it uh, very uh, musical and, and, and it's a very inspiring instrument of course because the sound is so is so good and how it plays and the, the setup but the Casio uh, HD 3000 or I got another Casio here which is the uh, uh, the, what is that thing called? SV thousand or something? Uh, for me, that's uh, uh, yeah. They, they have the same word, even though they're they're much much cheaper. But you can make sounds on it. You cannot make on here, and it can do stuff. Uh, yeah. So um, it, it's it's kind of all the same for me. And of course, um, 
uh, expensive synthesizers are for some uh, people more impressive because uh, you think you pay a lot, uh, a lot of money for a thing, so then it must be good. And uh, maybe people think, oh, and then I can make really professional music or uh, imitate uh, people, uh, the, the artists uh, that use it or something. And of course, you can do that, and it, it might help. But uh, yeah, I think you can make uh, the greatest album on a Casio HD three uh, thousand. Um, also, uh, then a on a profit five or a MOOC or or whatever. Um, a, few, a, a few weeks ago, I that was sort of the spark in a way to like, okay, I got to talk to you because I sent messages on WhatsApp to some friends. It's like, oh gosh, there's this uh, Casio. It's the seven hundred, you know, the the smaller one. The Casio. Yeah, this is the big version of that. Yeah. 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 yeah like in the next town for 70 pounds and it's like oh they have one and I, I I'm just going to go and get it and it's like have you gone all lego belt on us that's what my friend said to me uh -oh. so, so I was just like okay gosh yeah but and then I was thinking about this that you're looking at those synths and I I the cultural aspect that you were talking about like that sets off a genre and I think that's where a lot of these since that on the surface may look a bit more like the same it's like a black box there's no not that many knobs and sliders on them uh and i have totally been uh guilty of this as well like i just associated the dx7 with like 80s and early 90s pop music but the sounds you can make with that thing is absolutely incredible but to understand how something like a DX7 works and being able to create sounds that you want, I didn't do that until I actually used a software version and could sort of see it. And then I started understanding how it worked. But like how, how have you persevered and like all these like the S Way 35 or the Casio you got next to you, like how did you get over that threshold of like learning and squeezing sounds out of these that are not just the presets? Um, well, it, it, it is quite quite simple. That has never been a problem because yeah, when I was a, a, a kid, my first synthesizer was a Yamaha DX21, yeah. uh, which I uh, uh, got with my dad uh, from a secondhand uh, advertisement in a, in a paper. And uh, yeah, I thought, oh, you can make acid house with that. I can make three or three sounds with it. So then I took it home and I was very disappointed, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but then, yeah, I had that thing. And then after school, I would just uh, start uh, programming it. Uh, I had nothing else to do. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, th then I just learned um, this, uh, this machine uh, fully. I can program any um, uh, DX uh, uh, synthesizer now, and um, so that that was the first experience I had with a, a synthesizer. And uh, there is something um, interesting. Uh, for example, you men mentioned the Yamaha uh, SY35. I think um, that has actually a, a pretty easy uh, interface. And for me, these interfaces never have been a problem because they're they are quite um, intuitive in a way. You just have to go in a menu and then press a, a plus and minus. And it, it takes around uh, 20 minutes till you get used to that. And then you can uh, program sounds uh, pretty quick um, if you just uh, set your mind to it. And uh, actually, I like this um, uh, uh, way of programming uh, sounds. It's, it's actually quite interesting and uh yeah even fun maybe not the word but intriguing for me because it, it's a very um elaborate building process it's not just uh, uh randomly uh turning knobs or something but you kind of have to think uh of, of what you're gonna do uh and, 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 um, it, it's almost like uh, programming a computer uh program coding uh but yeah then you just uh, use uh, little knobs and um, yeah, for me, that, that is a very clear way of programming sounds. And um, yeah, I, I just uh, uh, yeah, I like that because it's very focused and you don't get, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, your mind wanders off. With, uh, distracted, uh, but yeah. 
Yeah. How do you? So, so I remember when I bought my uh, TX eighty one Z, like rack mounted Yamaha FM synthesizer. Yeah. When I got it, I knew how to. I knew what I was looking for, so I could sit down and program it. But if I compare that to, let's say, SH one hundred one or something, yeah. Where while I'm making music with this, I can just like all of you so quickly can change stuff and all of yeah. a sudden, oh gosh, that's, you know, like happy accidents. But with a TX, I feel like I almost have to sort of separate the process a bit and just sit down and just make sounds. Yeah. And, then, and then the next step is like, I do something with those sounds. How do you do that process with those ones, especially where you have to sort of spend a bit more time on, you know, actually building the sounds, even though you know what you're doing. Yeah, of course, it's not that 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 I really prefer this way of working. It's just because the the machine has this interface, and I have to deal with it, and I I accept that, and then I you know, and then I can find the en enjoyment in it because I want to hear these new undiscovered sounds. Um, so I, I will use an editor if that's available or a programmer, you know, uh, 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 there's a lot out these days. And, um, yeah, the thing is with, uh, for example, the TX81Z is, is cause you actually, you can, while it's playing, you can kind of change stuff with the up and down buttons. Yes. Yeah. You can. And then you can, you get very interesting artifacts. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, an artist who used to do that a lot is uh, New World Aquarium. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, Russ One Five Four, and uh, he made this album called Strike, um, which is a yeah legendary album, mainly using this TX eighty uh, one uh, Z, and you can really hear that the sounds evolve and change because he's like a yeah uh, uh, fiddling yeah. about well, it's well, it's it's through the presets. <laughs> and then you get also very interesting weird uh, artifacts and because uh, it's digital and sometimes it cannot uh, handle it and you get a it's a uh, yeah um so th that is yeah that is something where this uh because everybody is always talking about the lately bass in the tx uh, 81z but yeah that's it's much that's more interesting sounds you can make with yeah this. yeah that's such a boring uh you know yeah. uh, cliche sounds and it's capable of so much uh, interesting uh, interesting sounds yeah i just got for, for max for live a uh, uh, software programmer for the tx81 so i can make sounds a bit quicker but you sort of the the are you still there is it frozen hello Oh, uh, you were you were uh, glitched away. Uh, okay, here. yeah, right. Let's 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 hope it's it's. Uh... Yeah, you can cut that out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll cut, cut that. No problem. But uh, the um, I've got a, a Max for Live controller for the TX eighty one Z, but it runs out of MIDI. Like it's like it gets some sort of MIDI overload error. But I found a guy who's now built some sort of software where he's got to great length of getting around that so you can do much more sort of live manipulation with it. So I will see how that works. I haven't got the software yet, but okay. So you bought your DX21 and you were really disappointed with it to start with because you wanted to do acid and it didn't do acid in the way that you were hoping. So how long did it take before you got excited about it? Um, yeah, I, I think a couple of months or I, I don't really re remember because, yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I, I think I had an editor for it on the Commodore Amiga and then I could. Oh, also... did they come with an editor for, for the DX21? Yeah, there, there was a, any editor in existence was on the Commodore uh, Amiga. Um, uh, which was, of course, the, the the much more superior music making <laughs> computer than the <laughs> Atari ST. So, did you use Octomed or something like that when you were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm still using uh, Octomed today. I got the Amiga in this uh, closet. I can open up, and then there's a screen. But uh, yeah, that's a uh, very uh, good uh, music. You could take program. any any file and drop in as an audio file. You know, you didn't have to use, was it, was it AIFF or something? Was the sort of sound format or something like that? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but uh, you could take any, like an image or something and just like, yeah, through, yeah. It was just noise. Yeah, you could play that as a sample and then you got artistic uh, yeah. uh, art music, yeah. <laughs> and then there was also like, 
the, the dream was like to have something with the filter cap off, like in the nineties, like that's, you know, like the, the, because to be able to do that. And I remember I had sampled from, I think it was a Juno 106 of a friend, like literally just a filter sweep. And then in Octamed, you could change, offset the starting point. So yeah, you, and then you could filter. With yeah, it. yes. <laughs> that was like the best it could do. Yeah. Well, that, that's a very interesting trick. You can do it with any uh, sampler that doesn't yes. have a, a, a filter filter and of course there's a place for that too and a, a unique sound and the unique sound of uh, trackers and the commodore amiga especially um of course the, the sound is extremely out there it's really in your face it's super compressed if you sample something in it yeah. uh, somehow there's something going on with the sound uh, circuit that they really did well I don't know. I think the the people that did the sound chip for the Commodore Amiga were this were from Ensonic or something. I think. Oh, okay. or, oh and uh, so but, you actually make the RS uh, like EPS sixteen plus and those samplers the same company? No. Yeah, or they were involved with it. It's, it's or the the person worked for it. Uh, uh, but uh, of course that that uh, that made any sound like old school jungle is is uh, always sounds so uh um, punchy because of the commodore amiga uh, sound often and of course the other interesting way of the uh, octamet of trackers is that you only have four channels and the samples cut each other off so yeah. each channel is basically monophonic but you can put other sounds uh, uh, behind each other so that gives a very yeah, a staccato uh, groove or something. And, and also, like, wasn't it that two channels came out of the left and the other two came out of the right? Uh, yeah, but if you had a mixer, you could yeah, just... Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, we didn't have that. <laughs> I didn't have that. So it was just like you have to think about, like, how you did it. Yeah, uh, but, um, yeah, what, what, what I al always would do is also, I think I got a Cork MS-10. That was my first analog synthesizer, which was... Uh, yeah, really cheap back then. Um, um, and I put the Commodore Amiga uh, audio output through its filter. And then, yeah, you had a, basically a kind of do-it-yourself synthesizer with the uh, filter and could, could filter the sounds and stuff. So, yeah. At the time, like, do you, like, what about friends? Because I felt like then, like before internet and stuff, it wasn't... It wasn't as easy for me anyway. I grew up in a small town in Sweden uh, and it was just difficult to find out how things worked or how to do stuff. And there was a small music scene in the town where I grew up, but it was mainly revolving around punk. And there were some people who were into electronic music, but they were much less. Were you a group of friends that were doing this or were you very much on your own when you were sort of experimenting? Yeah, I was pretty much completely uh, by myself. Uh, my friends were, were not really interested in this. They thought actually some thought it was really stupid that I uh, started, that I said, yeah, I'm going to make house music. And then they were like, that's so dumb. And I thought, you know, whatever. Um but yeah, I had to find it out uh, all by myself, basically. Of course, uh, I could go to the library and uh, there would be a book about uh, MIDI and synthesizers, but it would be like from uh, really outdated from uh, the early 80s. And mm -hmm. yeah, for me back then, that was already for, uh, you know, like old people, because uh, this was in the, the 90s. And um, then... Uh, uh, they would never talk about house or techno music. It was all kind of focused on bands or like proc rock or something. Uh, but you would learn how to use MIDI and stuff. And I guess there were also magazines uh, somehow. And then, yeah, you would just, uh, if you could get your hand on, on a magazine about uh, MIDI or something, you would read every letter and um, also completely useless information you would uh, uh, yeah, read that. But I think most of the stuff is just by trial and error. Like with the DX21, the FM synth, I just tried stuff. 
um, bit by bit, and then I could understand in my own way what was uh, going on, uh, how to make a sound, you know. Yeah, you um, didn't understand what it was called. You just knew how to get towards the sound you wanted. Yeah, and I, I, I couldn't care less about the theory of FM synthesis. I always think that, that if you want to do something or learn something, uh, okay, sometimes it's interesting too, but you, you just you can you can learn. I think sometimes in, in a lot of situations, a lot more ju just by uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after a few years, maybe uh, I don't know, twenty years, you uh, think, oh, it's FM synthesis is just uh, sine waves that modulate each other. Uh, but um, you know, uh, it's like. A, uh, some stuff is, is probably still a mystery to me, like a reversed filter envelope. I don't, I think a lot that that's like the what is it in soccer where the player goes to that nobody understands. The, uh, <laughs> I have no idea, I don't know anything about football. So, like the, the inspiration, where does that come from then? For I suppose then it was, but but if we if we think now, if we go. Now, like, what sort of things do you get inspired by? Not necessarily uh, about equipment, but just music generally. Like, what makes you want to make music? Yeah, that, that's always a, a hard question to answer because I don't really understand uh, what uh, what is inspiring me. Of course, other music, uh, um, I think uh, that's one of the main, main things. But um, Especially when you're a kid, you want to make a, you love the, you know, I love the birds, the electronic music that would, would, would come out and you would hear that and you wanted to, I wanted to do that too, uh, because it was like a magical uh, thing that you could uh, make music with a synthesizer, make sounds that didn't exist. And um, yeah, so you just want to uh, yeah, imitate the artist you, you love. That's how I think everybody uh, starts, yeah. basically. And, um, or imitate, you want to do the same, uh, you know, make, make records, not exactly imitate. Uh, but then, um, yeah, and then of course you're inspired by all kinds of things. I think uh, like the mood you're in or the, the view out of the window here or whatever, but... Uh, because I feel mm. this is just my interpretation. When I was when I've listened to a lot of your music, a lot of the albums feels like you get a glimpse into a story. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily exactly say what's going on in the story, but it feels like I'm looking into a world. Uh, and that's you know under Lego Belt, but also under some of your other names. Is that a story or is that sort of something you just do after or because it feels like both the names of the tracks and some of the album cover covers yeah. hints on something mystical. Is there a world? Uh, yes, sir. But yeah, yeah, of course. But um, uh, there is, of course, a whole uh, whole uh, hyper reality around my uh, music. Um, and for me, it's very logical to to tell stories uh, with the music, because the the songs mm -hmm. are stories. It's basically uh, like how music has always been, you know, uh, since the uh, what is it, the uh, caveman sat by the the fire and uh, uh, would sing uh, uh, songs. There would be stories, and uh, you know, uh, a song is always a story, you know. We're, probably um, even a gobber track or whatever. So, um, But does the story yeah, first? Is it literally like you have an idea of like, okay, I'm going to try to evoke this world, or is it more like you just do something and then you just start getting a feeling once you start doing it? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it, it, yeah, it depends on uh, what the, a project is, but most of the time you just start and... Um, uh, it's not like, um, yeah, uh, people say uh, often I make like a concept uh, music, but I hate that for me. Uh, that's, uh, um, yeah, I don't know, the, the, the word conceptual is, is sounds terrible, but I guess um, sometimes that's what I'm doing. But um, yeah, for me, it's just uh, a, a normal thing to have these uh, stories in the music and uh, everything. 
And um, of course, I also make uh, animation uh, movies and stuff mm, like yes. that. And I made a big animation movie, and then I, I soundtrack it. And I, of course, it's also the the Shadow Wolf uh, uh, magazine, which has the uh, co comics. Oh Those yeah, are the, the story stories too. And uh, yeah, there's all so yeah, stories is uh, yeah, that's that's something an uh, an 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 yeah an, an artist is doing is telling stories. Mm -hmm. uh, at least a certain uh, artist, you know, you have uh, artists, uh, conceptual, uh, um, uh, modern, uh, I don't know, like, uh, uh, yeah, but, uh, well, whatever is in the museums. Uh, <laughs> now, now. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I know you've got quite a lot of you got like quite a lot of equipment and you have it. I remember seeing something that you had sort of two separate rooms. I don't know if that's still the case where you, where you make your music. Do you get, um, how do you, how do you know where to start? Like when you have quite a lot of things to choose from, how is there usually a starting point for you or what's, how does that work? Um, yeah, I, I don't think I, you, I think you're referring to a, uh, the future music, uh, I think that's probably it. Documentary. Yeah, I don't have that anymore. I, I don't live in that house anymore. I moved. Uh, I now have a studio uh, room here in this uh, new place. Uh, 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 yeah, how do I start? That's th there's so many ways to start, and um, I think it's important uh, if you if you make music to just be open uh, in any way of working. Mm -hmm. There should not be a, a standard way of working, and that is very important for me. Like. Um, I think I just uh, can make a track without a sequencer or uh, using MIDI. I, I can just uh, play something or uh, even um, uh, do the drums by hand and then record that and play something over that. Um, there, there's no rules for me. And um, that kind of stems uh, from what, uh, what we were t talking earlier about. Uh, in the uh, in the 90s, there was no internet and nobody told you how to do things. So I would just kind of in a yeah, very do-it-yourself punk style approach, uh, just uh, start experimenting. Mm. And then I probably uh, did a lot of stuff uh, yeah, wrong for, uh, for certain uh, people or against the rules or you could not do that or whatever. Um, like... Uh, yeah, uh, so starting a track can be can be anything, and um, of course uh, there's the usual way of uh, starting with a beat and then a bass line, and uh, that 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 can work. But uh, yeah, it, it's whatever, and sometimes you, it goes completely automatic, and you don't think about it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, sometimes I make a, a song or a track, and I don't have absolutely no clue. Uh, how I made it. I, the next day, I uh, I see it on my uh, computer and think, oh, that's that's cool. But I cannot even remember how I made it because um, uh, it is we're in such a focus or uh, what is it hyper focus or something. Um, and then yes, yeah, so sometimes I then have uh, tracks and I, um, and I, I'm not sure if I made them. Uh, <laughs> Like, like uh, yeah, one day there was in, in, the, in my map, there was a, oh, that's a cool track. But I, but that was then a few weeks later that I discovered like a WAV file in my thing. And I thought, well, this, this must be a track I made. Um, but then I think I delete, I, I saved it on the desktop and then I cleaned it up. And I, while I could see, okay, I made this, but then, uh, and, and somebody wanted really to release this track. But I didn't release it because I wasn't 100% sure if I made it. Oh, I see. <laughs> and it, it has happened to, uh, I think, Jeff Mills. Oh, really? <laughs> that, that was around that time uh, that, that Jeff Mills released a track that wasn't from him. And um, it was a demo somebody sent. Oh, really? Gosh. Yeah. And nope. then everybody was like, oh, Jeff Mills is like releasing uh, other people's music under his name or whatever. And yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, I said, oh, you know what? That, uh, that's something that, uh, that, that I, um, you know, if, if you make a lot of music uh, and then um, 
yeah, somehow a file gets mixed up and maybe and you don't you know you're in the zone and you know don't know anymore i thought oh maybe maybe that happens uh, with that but uh yeah um that was uh, i don't know what the question was anymore it was oh how to start a track yeah yeah but actually it's maybe it's more interesting how to finish a track i was looking at your discography is enormous you know like under so many different names you've done so much music like do you work very fast or like i i, I just can't comprehend how you can have made so much music <laughs> yeah well a, a lot of the, the quality for for uh, uh some some you know uh, some labels they said they, they will release anything um but uh yeah um the, the question is how to, how to finish a, a track, I guess. I, I think like, are you quite good at finishing things you start? Or do you have a million projects that you never finish? A million? Uh, yeah, of course. There, there's always stuff that, that doesn't go anywhere, maybe. Yeah. and Or that is really like uh, too too bad to, to release or something. But, um, you know, I've, I've been doing this for... Yeah, uh, thirty years now. So, yeah, for me, it's it's absolutely not not a problem to finish a track, and I never. Also, in the beginning, I didn't really have uh, problems with that because uh, yeah, it's it's just something uh, you you do, I guess. And and with with comp with computers, it's really easy. You can save everything and how it is, but. Uh, um, uh yeah uh, so uh then you can work on it the next day and and, and stuff like that so um yeah i never had a, 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 a I, I cannot give much advice also on um, to um, how to finish a track because it's something i just just do yeah. or don't think about it too much i think if if there's a and if there's a problem maybe that that's some advice if there's a problem in the track uh, just delete it and, and yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Out. I, I think I, th I think it's more. It's just interesting to hear that you just like get on with it and just finish it. Uh, I feel like I, if I'm to finish some music, I have to work fairly fast. I cannot work on a track for weeks and weeks and weeks. I find that difficult. I sort of have to sort of get on with it and finish it. And then that's easier for me rather than trying to come back over and over again and try try to sort of finesse and fix little things. And I just want to do it. <laughs> Which part of the process do you like? Not process, but apart what you do, do you have a, do you equally like playing live as to be in the studio making stuff or maybe even the animation? Like, do you have something that you prefer more than the other? Um, well, for for me, the the most fun thing is to to make the animation uh, movies because that's uh, and and the soundtracks for that and just drawing and uh, uh, thinking up uh, the story. Because <clears throat> with that, um, maybe that explains a bit the, the way of working. Um, uh, it's with the animation. I don't have a script or anything. I just start on a situation. And from there, the the story evolves, and I often don't know like where the the main character is, uh, what she's gonna do in in the next scene. Mm -hmm. And for me, that keeps it exciting because the story is developing while I make the animation, and that is possible to do in an animation film. Of course, there's this uh, French director who also works like that. He just puts a bunch of actors in in a in a location and then they just see where it ends. Uh, I don't know, is that, I don't remember the name, uh, uh, is it Louis Mal or Eric Romer, one of those. Yeah, I don't know, but yes. Yeah. And, right in the end, that sounds quite interesting if they manage to do yeah, so. And of course with the animation movie, you can, and if, if, if there's a mistake or something else, you can just uh, redraw the, that scene and, and, and connect it all together. But that's a process of a few years that, that comes together. And I am myself then also on that uh, 
journey of the uh, character and um, that keeps uh, for me also a motivation to, to keep drawing um, and thinking of new uh, uh, ideas or situations. And I guess I work uh, like that with the music too, uh, when I make a track. And of course, it's a, a much shir shorter uh, time to, to make it, because make it, I'm not working for years on a, on a, on a track. Uh, often I'm uh, working on uh, 10 different tracks at the same time. I mean, not at the exactly the same time, but like oh, no, no, uh, yeah, yeah. on the computer and um, uh, of course, and then wh whatever I feel like working on, then I, I, I work on it and then I can do it bit by bit. And sometimes you make a track in five minutes, uh, especially with the techno music. Uh, it's, uh, it's not very difficult to make a, a techno music, you know, it's not like a, oh, is it still working? Yeah, yeah. It broke up for a bit. It's I oh. think it's internet on the British countryside. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you you got the last thing or not? Uh, uh, the, the, the 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 last thing I heard was like, oh, it's not very difficult to make a techno track. You just and then it disappeared. Oh, okay. Well, you can cut that out, right? I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe because you said you got some stuff plugged in. Maybe you just make a techno track now. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> I can show you um, uh, uh, my um, yeah the 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 tendre wolf. I don't know if it's uh, um, yeah. So uh, this thing is a bit uh, mysterious for me because it, it, it got such bad reviews. You get so, excited when like someone says that something is a bit crap that you want to you just want to see like yeah. what can I do something with it. Yeah, well, well, a, a bit crap. It was uh, what is it? Universally panned. <laughs> yeah. a, a legendary Akai Dan um, a demo of it, of course, uh, yeah, it sparked my interest. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I got it from Spain or something, and um, and I must say, it is really, really bad. Um, it what, is, is, uh, what is it that makes it like what lives up to the bad expectations? Does it just sound bad? Yeah, it, it it it's the filter is so so weak, and you cannot really edit it. I I um I put it through a, a zoom uh, pedal to make a vibrato because okay. it doesn't have a LFO for a vibrato. It, uh, so you can make these kind of sounds, uh, and then this is the filter, and then. Yeah, uh, this sounds okay because I put it through the. Uh, um, and yeah, the sound uh, really comes down when you put the resonance. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then yeah, they use they said yeah, then it turns into a high pass filter at the uh, that was the sales pitch. Oh, it's <laughs> That's, uh, really smart. But and then. It has a, a howl function, which is a, a not so great distortion. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, of course. Um, um, has it got four voices? Do I remember that correctly? Was yeah, it? and it doesn't have envelopes or anything. The only thing you can change is this kind of weak filter, and then there's an envelope amount. So you can hear there's no, almost no change if you have the the cutoff like this. But if you're, you're not, and there's a, a DK or something uh, for for that, um, but basically it's like this really simple synthesizer with uh, four knobs mm. or uh, six, but this is volume and tuning. And uh, that's times four, and you can have different uh, sounds uh, with it. So it's almost uh, like a, a, a monopoly then, or something. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> also, not a, a poor person's monopoly. <laughs> Uh, but of course, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that it has a sequencer for each uh, part. Okay. Uh, so you can have uh, yeah four different melodies going at the same time, and of course you cannot transpose it. I think maybe you can, but I haven't figured it out yet. Um, but also a cool thing is that it uh, sends MIDI out. Of course, uh, to uh, uh, you can send MIDI to four different other. Uh, synthesizers 
Oh, so it's kind of a, a really fast, easy um, uh, MIDI sequencer. And um, yeah, and, and I've, I've been playing around with it. And I, I think it's <laughs> its power lies in its simplicity, but <laughs> in such a way that it's, that it's its only, um, how do you call it in English? Merit? It's only... Uh, yeah, 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 it's only merit. The only thing it's got going for it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's its extreme simplicity. You really don't have to read the manual because it's its its so um, self-explanatory. I will... Uh, it's, it's sequencing the Prophet 5 now here. But then... I can add, because uh, it has the volume, so I can add another sound coming from the uh, uh, Tamra Wolf. And uh, I add another one, which is going to be the bass. And then um, the third one is on the keyboard, so I can play it. some fun stuff with it but uh yeah it, it is really the synthesizer it, of course it, it makes a really simple analog uh tone either a square wave or what is a saw saw toot and do you have a solid thing or do you keep everything huh oh I, I just i, I sell all uh, all the time i've been on a, a gear spree the last uh month a bit i yeah. haven't bought much uh uh, for 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 a while, and then yeah, sometimes you you get this itch, and I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's just this face. I mean, and, uh, what sort of things did you go for? So you bought the Tombra Wolf, and uh, yeah, well, and, uh, the the, the Casio HT three thousand. My my wife was also on a spree to to uh, buying. Uh, uh, she, she actually started with it. She started buying all these uh, old keyboards from the effort. <laughs> so she's sort of like part of your addiction or <laughs> helping out oh, with it. Your... Is she part I, of I didn't get... feeding your synth addiction that you are? <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I, I guess so. And then, um, yeah, then I saw, oh, there's this thing for sale. And uh, yeah, but I, I got the drum machine too from this uh, series. Okay. Is... Mm. That's bad <laughs> and, uh, as well. Yeah, and I got a Boss DR, uh, what is it, DR1110 from... Oh, is that, is that almost like a... a, a is that the it's, it's a poor person's 808, yeah. Yeah, sort of like a poor person's 606, even. Yeah, but then it has the legendary clap sound in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, I think Behringer put it in their uh, 606 uh, remake. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a fun little uh, drum machine with a trigger out. So, um, yeah, and, and uh, what else? Oh, I got um, a mini Nova because I was uh, uh, I had this uh, project last week. I had to uh, make sound uh, or a composition with an orchestra, uh, brass orchestra, and a ballet in um, in Estonia for a festival. And um, yeah, I, I don't know why I I thought oh, well, the mini Nova is uh, good to bring with me to uh, to a common accompany this, uh, yeah, this no. uh, uh, project. I don't know uh, why the mini Nova. That was just an excuse maybe to buy a mini Nova. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I at first I was a bit underwhelmed by its sound. Yeah, especially the presets were like, oh, it's a uh, lot of rave sounds in there, aren't there? Or like <laughs> cheap sounding rave sounds. Yeah, but then it says it's like the <clears throat> the engine of the old Nova synths or something, or okay. based on that. And uh, that's one of my all time favorite uh, uh, since the nineties uh, Nova Supernova. I got a Supernova and a, a Nova. That, oh, uh, I see. Okay. 
and it's one of the best sounding uh, synths for me is how liquid and 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 detailed it is but that's in the in the 90s so uh, digital um virtual analog synths maybe sound better than uh, than the than the new ones but uh while i was in estonia i was there for a week and i had to use it i got uh, really acquainted with the uh, uh, mini nova and i programmed a lot of uh, sounds uh, in it and um it's quite a powerful uh, uh yeah synthesis engine it's got like six envelope generators and three lfos and uh, you can do a lot of weird uh, stuff with it so that is uh, interesting and if you put it to a i don't know to a cork uh, monotron delay it sounds really uh, nice uh, again yeah is if if you turn around is there is that a zoom rack effect box there oh this yeah this is the zoom studio uh 1201 Oh, okay. The most legendary, uh, um, yeah, multi effects uh, from the '90s, and these were super cheap in the '90s. I think they're still cheap for now. And I bought, I bought the 1204 in the '90s. I yeah, think. that that is very similar. Uh, the 1204 has a memory. This one doesn't have memory. It has a few more uh, buttons, but it also has a few more effects that the 1204 doesn't have. Oh, okay. It's got really good, uh, yeah, low-fi effects, and you can emulate the tape or whatever. And um, it actually has a really good vocoder too. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. The 1204 has got a vocoder as well. Yeah, and a pitch shifter and and stuff like that. And uh, with with vocoders, it's all. Oh, I also want to say about the Mini Nova that yeah. it is an excellent vocoder. It's okay. Really, um, and voice uh, effects are maybe that's the the killer app of the Mini Nova. Uh, I was quite uh, surprised, and they put in like a little uh, microphone on a stand uh, too. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, I didn't know. Um, um, it, it had such a good vocoder, but uh, with vocoders uh, like the Zoom 1201 or uh, a lot of other vocoders, it's also how you put in the sound. If you put your voice in it with a little bit of EQ and compression, you can get much uh, more professional results. And, uh, yeah. What do you think, for example, like the, there's a lot of the Alice's like Quadraverb and Midiverb 2. They have gone yeah. up in price like crazy, but the Zoom is really cheap. And another one that I have is I got two different ones from Art, like pink. Oh. Uh, and I think they sound. I think they sound amazing. I, I just love, but they don't cost anything. They're so cheap. Oh, the Art ones. Yeah, I, I had a really simple Art effect, but uh, uh, I got a, a compressors and stuff from Art. Uh, but I got uh, uh, I got a lot of Alesis uh, uh, reverbs. I got the MIDI verb two here. I've never it's, tried that one. I got the Quadra verb, which is on a long term yeah. loan, but that's the only one I have. It's very nineties uh, IDM uh, music, of course. But the MIDI verb two is the most uh, sought after, I think, because yeah. it has the Bloom uh, Shimmer uh, reverb. Oh, I see. And um, they didn't put it in the other ones. And I got a Alesis MIDI for four, which these things are these things are really super cheap. If it's not the MIDI for two, you can get these uh, for nothing. Also, the Quadra verb you can uh, uh, find it at uh, at the, at the thrift store maybe now. Um, apparently, the, the one of the artifacts I have apparently that very unit used to belong to Dave Clark when he did. Oh. Uh, wisdom to the wise so apparently that has been going through the effect box in my studio i don't know if this is true or if the guy sold it to me just made it up i don't know <laughs> yeah oh just to sell it well <laughs> i don't know but i got it cheap anyway <laughs> yeah oh that's cool yeah art yeah. Hmm. so do you use uh i was thinking like you have a lot of hardware and when you're working so do you like I assume you're using a computer to record everything into. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And Ableton, or or do you have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ableton is uh, my uh, yeah my second brain almost. Okay, yeah. So, do you do do you generally rely on for effects and sound sources your hardware, or do you use a lot of software as well? 
No, for me, there's also no no difference between uh, VST synths and hardware. Uh, for me, it's it, like how I see cheap synths and expensive synths. They're all cultural phenomenons. Mm -hmm. uh, they all have their own worth. And uh, yeah, I, I I use a lot of VSTs um, all the time. And uh, um, yeah. The, the, uh, it, it, sounds really good VSTs and a lot of times they sound better than the, the hardware, uh, mm -hmm. even like uh, stuff like a uh, repro uh, from Uhi. Uhi, what is it? Yeah, 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 I know him, yeah. Uh, it's like also live, if you throw that to a, a, a PA, sometimes I have a hardware synth live and a computer with running VSTs and then the pro repro one, uh, a repro five. Uh, um yeah, that sound is so massive that comes out of the uh, out of these vsts so um yeah and these days a lot of synths uh, are also uh, vsts uh, and uh, uh, so i, I never seen uh, any difference with that also because i come from the commodore amiga uh, uh that was where i first uh yeah uh made my first music with yeah, and, yeah. It's, uh, it's an 8-bit uh, sound system on a 16-bit machine or 32-bit later with uh, Amiga 1200. But um, yeah, then in the 90s, you didn't uh, go, oh, this is, uh, this is not hardware. This is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, how do you call it? It's uh, inferior. Or something. Yeah, it's not real. <laughs> I, I think that whole idea of, uh, I don't know if people still think that, that like uh, you cannot use computers. Uh, I think yeah. some do. I think there's probably some who think that. Yeah, you're not like grumpy, grumpy, uh, grumpy middle-aged man. Yeah, yeah. Who bought all the synthesizers and they don't want to feel like they wasted their money. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, do you? Because you, I feel like a lot of your music have loads of character. Like it's, it's like the, the sound. Do you? Do you collaborate with other people? Is there a lot of, when you've finished your music, do you have other people doing mastering and, you know, do that sort of thing? Or do you see your music from beginning to end? Uh, no, yeah, it, it depends on, on my own label, Nightwind Records. I, I do almost everything myself, also the mastering and, uh, and, and really detailed. But if it's on a, a record label, there's a, a, they have their own mastering uh, engineers or they hire one to, to master it. And then, um, yeah, uh, yeah, so, uh, but that's not really a collaboration. That's just a, a, a person in the chain of yeah, yeah, yeah. music. And um, yeah, of course, I collaborate uh, with people on uh, on music. Um, I actually doing that a bit more because for years I didn't do any collaborations. Um, I was really into my own own bubble. And of course, I started in the nineties also um, uh, when I went to. Uh, to a, a big, bigger school, uh, I, I met Orc Electronique, uh, Brian, uh, and I collaborated with him on uh, some records. Um, and also uh, Luke Ergogo from Stillabe Records. I did some records with him in the- He's Swedish, right? He's Swedish. Swedish, yeah, from Goethe. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but then uh, yeah, I didn't do, an, and then last year, uh, two years ago, three years ago, I did a collaboration again with um, a Japanese uh, artist uh, called uh, Taka Noda, Taka Fumi Noda, uh, known as Mystica Tribe, and he makes a uh, digital dub with uh, uh, Melodica. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we made a, a project together, which is uh, uh, called uh, Noda and Wolfers. It's not the greatest uh, artist name, but uh, uh, which was uh, quite quite uh, successful. Uh, really, it's a kind of a, a minimal synth wave, eighties uh, raw synth wave uh, combined with digital dub, and um, I think that worked quite well. And I did a, a project with uh, a guy from Toronto, um, Andre Roderick. Uh, from uh, Ebony, that's the band he's in, and uh, he's a really uh, fantastic uh, singer, like a, 
uh, he, he also makes uh, electronic music and um, yeah, we collaborated on that, but then we put vocals of him over it and that will be out uh, probably uh, early next year, I think. And I did a collaboration with a, a guy from The Hague called uh, Shook Music. And um, yeah, he's a really uh, funny um, a guy, a, a huge fan of uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, he uh, he really, uh, uh, for me, it was a very interesting way of working because the first time he came over, I had set up everything with MIDI because I thought, oh, this guy's professional. And then he said, oh, I never use MIDI in my life. I don't know how, how that works. And then... Um, <clears throat> Uh, just the play the keys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, then uh, we just press record with the metronome on and have one bass drum. And he just plays the whole bass line, including all the transpositions in one go. And then uh, I, re I record the MIDI of that, of course, in, in Ableton and the audio. And then, uh, yeah, we play some chords over it. And then, uh, uh, yeah. So this guy's a really uh, professional keyboard player. Uh, Shook uh, music and um, yeah, in interesting, uh, interesting, funny person. Yeah, I think his his music was played in the International Space Station. Oh wow! <laughs> I think he he likes to tell it always, and uh, yeah, uh, so if you yeah check that out on um, Instagram or something wherever. Yeah. All right, I've I've taken up a lot of your time, but just a few quick last questions. One is. Saab Knutson, is that yeah. how you say? Like, <laughs> where, where does that name come from? It's like the favorite, uh, uh, like, I, it's such a good name. Or Bontempi 666 is also very good. Yeah, the Bontempi 666 is actually uh, that, uh, that's on the, on the keyboard. It's, uh, it's the model really? it say from, from Bontempi. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. It, it's called BT805. That's the type number, but then it says 666 sounds on, on it or something. <laughs> oh, there, is, okay. there is 666 uh, printed on the thing quite big. Oh, okay. They make a big deal about it, that it has that sound or. <laughs> um, yeah, and Saab Knutson, that was, of course, a project I did uh, called Electronic Music from the Fagor Islands. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, this was then uh, a, a um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's like a character you, you make, you know. And uh, this was then a person that lived in uh, uh, the Faroe Islands in the '90s and and made uh, music um, with uh, stuff from that time. I actually used like a DX100. Um, okay. Is, is used in that, uh, which is a really dusty, uh, you can really make the dusty FM sounds with it. And um, I know SAP is is a, is not a Farrer name at all. And Knutsen also not. Um, uh, I don't think it's SAP name at all. I well, mean, it's a car. In yeah, it's Knutsen sounds it's like a Swedish car. name. So that's such a, yeah, I was just wondering, yeah. Yeah, no, it was just... Uh, uh, taking the piss with uh, Scandinavian people. <laughs> I think the Scandinavian people love it. Yeah, it was a uh, yeah. I think it was it was used in um in a, a soundtrack of a um what is it like a Christmas story audio book about a, uh, a, a kind of a horror story uh, that plays on uh, the Farmer Islands. From the, uh, I think it was the, the the brother of Louis Thoreau that does that or something. Oh right, okay. I vaguely remember. So it's it's on my website if you if you uh, look yeah, for I'll it because it's many years ago that it uh, was done. Yeah. Is there anything else that you feel like you that we haven't spoken about that you think would be interesting for someone to hear? Something we don't know about you and your music. Uh, well, that, that's a difficult question because it has to come up uh, with me, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's probably a thousand things that uh, that I can tell. Is particularly, you're excited about to do next? Any upcoming projects? Um. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. I I got a lot of stuff coming up. Um. 
uh, right now I'm a, a bit in a, in a, in a blank, what, what there is. Uh, I got a new album coming out on Clone Records uh, called A Field Guide to the Void. And it's mostly uh, electro uh, with very melodic electro uh, that should be out in October. Uh, I'm probably forgetting uh, like a, a, a real uh, big project. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a new animation film with a soundtrack that's going to be the uh, sequel to Ambient Trip Commander, the animation film that came out uh, two years ago. It will have the same character in it, uh, Samantha uh, Topfer Stern. And uh, yeah, she goes to a um, coastal village for a little uh, holiday so she can work on uh, record her uh, new album uh, in a uh, cottage or a cabin in the dunes. But then, of course, there's uh, something uh, eerie going on in the in the village. And uh, yeah, she gets involved in that. And um, I hope that this animation will be finished in 2025, but it's of course all uh, hand-drawn and um, I need to have the time to work on it because there, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, um, uh, all the time. Like I have to play gigs and uh, work on other, other stuff. Uh, so th that is probably uh, for me the the most uh, interesting uh, project. Yeah, right. And also, like on that playing live gigs, you're coming to the UK again. Were you here this weekend? Just been you played at? Yeah, I, I was at the Hilton Festival because yeah. after the ballet in Estonia, I flew uh, with Ryanair straight to uh, to uh, Stansted, and then they drove me two hours to a youth and it's in Kings Lynn. Is that Norfolk or something? Was yes, it really? Yeah. Uh, I know some friends went there. I couldn't go, yeah. uh, but it's yes, a festival with with a it had a crazy lineup. Like yeah. uh, wow, it's uh, uh, like um, uh, artists you really want to see, like Model Five Hundred, uh, Moody Man, and. Um, Mary Davidson and uh, oh yeah, Ricardo Villa Lobos played there too. It has a super cool lineup. Uh, uh, so there was a, yeah, but yeah, I, I came there in, in the forest and then I played and then I had to go uh, travel back again. Um, so yeah, but I will be back in the UK in, I think, October. Yeah. To do a. Uh, 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 mechanic, yeah, Mechanica Bristonica, I think it's called, or something yeah, like that. In, in Bristol, yeah. yeah. Yes. The day before I play in Scotland. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to play in England uh, more in the future because, uh, yeah, because it's, it's, it's well, not difficult, but you need like a working visa these days if you live in Europe. <laughs> yeah. It's really ridiculous. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I didn't uh, have a permanent working visa yet, so I, I have to do a, a, a one by one all the time, and then it takes uh, hours to get into uh, England nowadays for me. Yeah. I could wait uh, one and a half hour when I went to uh, Uton, but uh, I, I get used to it. Um, yeah, so I hope to play in England uh, a lot more uh, sooner when I got my uh, pro proper working visa. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Bristol. That's going to be really good because I've never seen you play live before. So that will be yeah, good. It's going to be fun, I think. It's a synthesizer party, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, I went last year and I was, I didn't really know what to expect, but I really enjoyed it. Like it was just, yes, yeah, so you get gigs, but there's also like gear on show and talks with people and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very nice. Look, mom, no computer is also playing, I think. Yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think these, uh, yeah, synth synth influencers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are one too. But thank you so yeah. much for your time and to have this chat. I'm yeah. going to uh, press stop on the recording. So, but yeah. don't disappear. H hang in there. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.